employer for 25 years before becoming an MP. The former leader of the Green Party, Caroline Lucas. Zanny Minton Beddoes, editor-in-chief of The Economist magazine and advocate of a second referendum on Brexit. And commentator, Brexit supporter and author of several novels, including the prize-winning, we need to talk about Kevin, Lionel Schreiber. Welcome to our panel, to our audience here and to you at home. Do join in the conversation, argue along using hashtag BBCQT on Facebook, on Instagram and on Twitter. Right, let's get started. Let's get stuck in with our first question for Mary Thomas. Is our current NHS safe in any post-Brexit trade deal? Andy, the Labour Party have been talking about this quite a lot over the last day or two. Yes, we have, and, and we've got our grave concerns uh, about the security of the, of the NHS. And, of course, we have been saying for some time that there's a desire on the part of the Conservative government to engage with America uh, to allow full market access. And, of course, that's been uh, denied. We then subsequently... Uh, discovered redacted uh, documents that gave us an indication that discussions had taken place. Then, as you saw yesterday, we saw 451 pages of notes relating to discussions that had taken place between uh, UK officials and US officials and the pharmaceutical industry. And did anywhere in those 451 pages, did it say, did anyone on the part of the government say, yes, let's put the NHS on the table? Well, you, you recall that uh, uh, when Donald Trump stood next to Theresa May and he said that the NHS is on the table, she didn't, didn't disabuse him of that. He then said that it, it wasn't Donald Trump. He then made a, a statement later on saying he wasn't going to yes, get involved Yes, but you in look the into that, the documentation, there's reference to those services, to pharmaceuticals, to data uh, about those, those issues. It is abundantly clear that that's the prize... And we, I think many of us saw the Dispatches documentary where the pharmaceutical industry in the United States and uh, politicians made it abundantly clear that they want to use these trade, trade talks to secure an infinitely better return than they're currently getting. And, and that is the, the whole thrust of this. And this could cost us dear. Uh, and the reality is that the um, uh, American companies are wanting to get a better return that, they, that they're getting now and their own uh, patients pay an awful lot more and that's the balance that they want. And this should really worry us because if it does undermine our NHS, it will put such a hole in the finances that it will make it untenable and we should okay. be very concerned about it. Uh, Zani, of course... The US does already provide services to the NHS and the, the NHS does buy some drugs from US pharmaceutical companies. It does. Um, I think it's fair to say that it's going to be up to the UK whether it opens the NHS for further US access in any trade deal. But I think the... the well, you're absolutely right that the, some services are already provided, but more importantly, it is a priority, as Andy says, for the US to have what it calls fairer prices for its pharmaceutical products. And the UK can say no... The UK can also say no to another US priority, which is to have access to the UK markets for its agricultural exports. But if Britain says no to everything, it just makes a US trade deal much less likely. And so I think it's, it's not so much a question of, is the NHS going to be wrecked? Because I think there'll be huge, huge political anger here at the NHS being up for sale in any way. So I think it's politically impossible. But I think that is, means that a US trade deal is just much less likely than this government thinks it is, because these are priorities for the United States. Brandon? Oh, well, to give Mary a short, unusually short answer from a politician, yes, it is safe. And just to cut through that, I, mean, I think it's pretty dreadful, that sort of scaremongering Andy's given. As you said, Fiona, quite rightly, there is nothing in these documents. First of all, these documents aren't some great finding. They've been on the internet for four weeks or so. Um, but there's nothing in there that infers anything of the sort. And both Matt Hancock, the Health Secretary, Liz Truss, uh, the... Uh, Trade, Trade Secretary and the Prime Minister have been very clear. The NHS is not on the table, it wouldn't be on the table, and we would walk away rather than allow the NHS to why be on the table. Then so why, did, why did it form any part of those documents at all? Well, I mean, if, it, if, it's, if it's off the table, as clearly as Boris Johnson says so, why wasn't that made clear well, in those first documents? first of all, I think 
over the last couple of years, bear in mind there is no mention in the NHS, I think there might be one mention in the whole of 2019, but those documents have no reference to or mention to any opportunity for the NHS being on the table for the USA. I personally, and the Conservative Party, the Prime Minister has been very clear, believe in uh, health care mm. being free at the point of, uh, of, of need. And I also believe I want everybody in the UK to have access to the best possible health care and the drugs that they need to deal with the symptoms that they have got. That's what the National Health Service should provide, does provide, so and we why, will continue so to invest I'm in I'm still it. not clear. So if it's so obviously off the table, why wasn't that said in the documents? Why was it kept on the table in the documents? But it's not. In those documents, there is no mention whatsoever of the NHS being on the table. There just isn't. This is an utter scare well, The, the Labour Party got the pretty Americans desperate said they wouldn't over where they are in the general change. election. They put it in the documents. So they haven't got an answer to the whole range of issues. And access to, yeah, to, and, and, to, to and obviously, the UK. But, but there is no reference to the NHS being for sale. It is not and it will not be on the table. Right, there's a lot of hands up here. Yes, the man there in the pink shirt. It seems like Labour are trying to whip up a storm in a teacup over these um, NHS documents when all they're really trying to do is drive attention away from their floundering on Brexit. Okay. I think, I think um, it's difficult because we have lots of evidence that Donald Trump and Boris Johnson are not to be trusted. But, it, but, I, but I, think, I think secondly, it would be easier if it was as obvious as doing a simple trade deal. I think what's happening and has been happening for several years, probably longer, is that there's a large sum of the NHS budget already being spent and handed over to private companies in exchange for services to the NHS, and they're not delivering. That's right. That's it's the a, problem. It's about 7%, actually, just to, to, to put a figure which on is it. A, which is a large sum of money. And actually, as a nurse myself, who is proud to work for the NHS, which, yes, delivers freely at the point of... Um, entry, but actually we're not able to deliver uh, adequate service at, in the emergency department anymore because it's just been underfunded year after year after year and there's frustration across the board be, from mental health perspective and a general um, health perspective as well. So as someone who works in the NHS, are you worried about the NHS in the post-Brexit trade deal? Absolutely, absolutely. I feel like um, the people who work for the NHS and on behalf of the NHS are very dedicated and believe in the culture of delivering a health service that is free and accessible to all. What worries me is that having worked for that organisation for 20 years, I feel like year after year after year, we're able to deliver less and less and less, and the need is just increasing all the time. Mm. Um, Lionel, coming back to the original question, uh, and obviously uh, Andy has raised the, the bogeyman of, of America and, and big pharma in the States. What's your view on this? Well, um, I think the simplistic uh, slogan, not for sale, is, is cynical. And um, the truth is that, uh, as for the NHS, nobody wants to buy it. I mean, it wouldn't be a great investment. <laughs> uh, but there's aspects of it they might want access to. Data, for example, or the ability to sell drugs what, what into the, the NHS. The only thing that has been remotely on the table has been um, the price of pharmaceuticals that were developed in the United States. And... The NHS already negotiates with American pharmaceutical companies over the prices, and obviously the companies want to charge more. I mean, one of the things that we're dealing with is an inequity, which um, I feel torn about because um, I live part of the year in the United States. I'm American, but um, I live most of the year over here. But uh, Americans like me are um, carrying the costs of research and development for drugs for the whole world. And I, I honestly don't know what, what that, the answer to this is, but uh, you get a much better deal than anyone in the United States who pay, pays multiples uh, uh, for the same drugs. Karen? Well, I think it's really important to remember that, that Trump himself has said, and I quote, I have directed our trade representatives to make this a top priority with every trading partner. And he's referring to the idea of extending these patents so that... Uh, the, those drugs will be more expensive than the generic 
uh, ordinary drugs. And so that is a very real risk, I think, to um, our NHS. And at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, who do you trust? And when Boris Johnson says, you know, don't worry, this is not on the table, I think you have to ask yourself two things. One, why didn't it actually get properly written into these documents that the NHS isn't on the table? Because other issues were written like that from the US side. They were actually ruled out, and we haven't ruled it out. But climate, secondly, climate change, and secondly, for example. Climate change, for climate example. Change. And secondly, just do you trust the same man who said, for example, that he was going to build 40 hospitals that turned out to be six, that said he was going to recruit 50,000 new nurses, and it turns out there's 30,000, if we're lucky, who's supposed to be prostate in a, in a ditch, I think, because we didn't leave the EU at the end of October. This is the man who lies whenever it suits him, and I wouldn't trust his word on whether or not the NHS is safe at all. And if we wanted to know, one last point, if we wanted to know one way to make it more uh, clear would be to increase the transparency around our trade negotiations. And what's really interesting is that the new trade bill that Liam Fox was trying to get through Parliament before we were prorogued was absolutely reducing the scrutiny of MPs over trade policy. So no wonder people are concerned about this. The man in the blue shirt. Yes, if we leave the EU uh, without a decent trade deal, um, we're going to be desperate for a deal with the US, and the US know that. Uh, and that will give them immense leverage uh, to negotiate on their terms, and we'll be on our knees begging for it. I know when Trump was over, um, and he wasn't too sure what the NHS was, but there's plenty of American pharmaceuticals that do, and they're going to be knocking at our door. There's a woman right at the back. As a consultant working in the um, NHS as a psychiatrist, I think regardless of the trade deals with the US, we are seeing privatisation of the NHS by stealth. And I think one of the things that really worries me about that is the people who are working in those private sector companies are trained in the NHS, so it's clinical experience, clinical skills that are being lost all the time. And I think that's my worry, that if, and we're already talking about staff morale being very low in the NHS, if we've got to pay increased drug prices, etc., it just... I think it just impacts on um, morale in the NHS more and more and more. And I think that is a real worry around privatisation. I'm concerned about the NHS continuing as it is. Let's take it on this theme of the NHS. Let's take another question now from Alex Secker. If I have three apples and the Conservatives give me two more, do I have five more apples? <laughs> 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 Depends when you started counting the five. Look, the, it, would you like to? Would you like to enlighten? This is, this is, this everybody is as to what that question is yeah, referring yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely, this is referring to the to the nurses. This is where I think Caroline is, the nurses and more nurses. nurses of the NHS. And this is where I think the point Caroline made a little while ago is uh, not entirely uh, fair or accurate. What we have said is there will be in five years' time, at the end of the Parliament, fifty thousand more nurses. And there will be, because what we, when, we, when you model, we're looking at what there will be if we do nothing. We don't change anything, we keep the system that we have got now. With the attrition and the lack of retention with nurses, we will be losing nurses in the NHS. We want to recruit more nurses, both from abroad and recruit more people into nursing here in the UK. We want to bring people back who have left the sector and we want to hold retention at a better levels. If we make the changes we want to make, we believe that will deliver 50,000 more nurses at the end of the Parliament than there would have been if we made no change. <laughs> that is where it is 50,000 okay. nurses. And it well, is. Look, look, Alex... 30,000, well, 32,000 of them are new, but it's 50,000 more than there would otherwise have been. Now, Alex, you're, am I right you're a primary school teacher? Uh, no, I'm a film and TV teacher. You're a film and TV teacher, yeah. forgive me. You're asking this question, I'm assuming, because... Some of these nurses, 18,500, are from nurses who are already nurses. Uh, they're not new nurses as such, they're, they're nurses now. Is it, that's what you're getting yeah. at? Yeah. yeah. So, so what are you saying? Is it creative accounting? Is that what you're...? It's just nonsense, isn't it? It's just okay. a lie. <laughs> <laughs> OK. As I said, there are 18,000 nurses who will leave if, they, if we don't retain them. We want to make changes so we improve retention. Also bringing back people who have already left so that in five years' time there will be 50,000 nurses more than there would have been if we made no changes. 32,000 of those are entirely new staff we want to recruit into the sector. Around 18,000 are improving our retention processes. So what do you think when, when people are laughing 
Uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, look, I do, I'm not sure I, they're laughing at the because, suggestion at the no, maths no, I, of it. Or? Look, I, do, I do understand, but look, I could say to you there will be 30,000 new nurses, and we're aiming to get 32, just under 32,000 new nurses. We're also being very upfront and transparent about the fact we have a problem with retention in the NHS. The lady just earlier on mentioned this. In the NHS with nurses. We want to do something about that and encourage some who have already left to come back. That's the other 18 plus thousand. That means in five years we would have 50,000 more nurses than we will otherwise have. That's not 18 plus thousand more. That's 18 plus thousand more nurses. Retained. More nurses that's we how that works. If we kept the status quo. You can't make up maths. Like, you just can't. That's a lie. Well, just, what you're saying is a lie. You're lying to everyone. It's a lie. I asked my eight-year-old this question before I came here tonight, and she knew the right answer. Well, like, look, uh, you're uh, lying. Saying, I can only say to you the fact. The fact is, That's if we make no change, okay, we let, keep let the status quo, we will be losing more and more nurses from the NHS, which we don't want. We want to retain more nurses. And actually within that figure, it's not just retention of who's already there, it's encouraging back in some who have already left. There will be, with the changes we want to make and the re extra recruitment of the new nurses, 30, over 31,000, almost 32,000 extra nurses, new nurses, there will be 50,000 more nurses in five years' time <laughs> than there would otherwise be. The truth is, though, that with the kind of Brexit you're pursuing, first of all, we're going to have the, an end to freedom of movement. So you're probably going to have even fewer nurses coming from the EU into our NHS. You're also making the nurses that are inside the NHS right now feel even less welcome than they did before, so they're leaving. You're treating them appallingly. It's been so, you know, things like the nursing bursaries uh, being cut, uh, the way in which there are so many now uh, nurses who are, who are so stressed because they're so short-staffed on so many of the, of the wards, and I hear this uh, in my constituency in Brighton all the time, that the stress on those nurses that are there is immense. So this idea that your creative bit of accounting is suddenly going to make nurses come back to the NHS in droves is just fantasy. And it's also insulting to people because we're laughing, but actually it's not funny. It's not funny to have a prime minister and ministers who just simply <laughs> make stuff up. I agree with that. And I think it goes broader. I think we are all... Um, failing to acknowledge one thing, which is that we need to spend more money on the NHS. We're getting older. As we get older, we get sicker. That means more money needs to be spent on the NHS. Now, the Tories have all kinds of creative accounting, magicking nurses around the place, but the bottom line is they're not going to be spending enough on the NHS, and they haven't come clean about that. The Labour Party has its own creative accounting, which is it's going to increase spending on the NHS, but it's, it says that it can all be funded by raising taxes only on business and the rich. That's equally mendacious, frankly. And so I think as a, as a country, we need to have an honest conversation. We're very proud of the NHS. There's lots of things to love about it. It's wonderful. But as we get older, as this country gets older, it means we need to spend more money on it. That means we have to pay more tax. And I think we need to be honest about that happening. And we're just not having that honest conversation anywhere. Okay. Now, I can see... The, the woman in the green, and who is a nurse, you've got your hand up, so I make a budget. Are there any other nurses in the audience? Just, just take your hand down if you're not a nurse. Right, so you're also a nurse in, in the... You're a midwife. Oh, well, let's hear from you as well. And then, and then we'll hear from you at, at the back. I'll make an exception for a second time, since this is... You are a nurse. Yes, let's hear from the midwife. Well, um, aside, of the, aside from the, um, the counting nonsense... Um, uh, it, recruitment is so um, difficult at the moment because of the bursary being cut and you're saying you're going to reintroduce it well that's marvellous but you cut it in the first place you were in government and you cut the bursary um, and as, as, a, as a midwife of, of, of 20 years I have seen how uh, things have changed in my practice and how there is so much less money just for every daily, daily things, daily resources. And we are literally scraping to try and find enough money to buy basic equipment. And yes, the, the woman in the green. There's a snide cynicism um, in the attitude when we talk about the NHS, because it's very easy to patronisingly say, no, who would want it? It's a... It's a, 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 an organisation in trouble. And, you know, it's kind of funny that we've made up these figures and there's a bit of a joke. But actually, the level of service and the level of care that still exists in the NHS <laughs> is of the highest standard. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll come to 
tune in, Andy. Lana. I wasn't being snide. I was being snide about the labor sloganeering, which I, th I think that's what's cynical. Um, and, and I think it's frustrating for voters in this country on both sides of the divide. Uh, we have, we have a, a, a health crisis here, and it's actually Western-wide. And using the NHS constantly as a political football is frustrating for the people who work for it, and it's frustrating for the patients. I mean, I, I, I don't think it, I, I think there are funding problems, but it's not all money, and I, I bet you could tell me that. Uh, that from what I've read, and it's all, you know, secondhand for me, but that there are serious organizational problems. And, you know, when, when Tony Blair threw massive amounts of money at the NHS, then it just became bloated in middle management. Am I right? Uh, now, I, 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 it's not as simple because, oh. for one, trying to turn it into business only is impossible because it involves people and people are unpredictable, okay? <laughs> but secondly, yes, Tony Blair threw money at the service, but it wasn't just middle management that got the benefit of that. It recognised areas of need and it thoroughly and in a quality way funded them the problem was it was knee-jerk and it wasn't followed up. So right. that, that quality and that level of funding and resource wasn't maintained. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I, I think, I'm just saying, we have to stop dealing this, with this always as a party political issue mm -hmm. and come together and figure out how to fund and organize the health service for the next mm -hmm. 20, 30 years and stop, you know, just turning it into a mudslinging uh, match or a competition between each party as to who's going to put more money into it. Uh, it needs to be more intelligent than that. Andy? Well, do you need to be having a more intelligent conversation about the NHS? We certainly do, but I just think we just need to pause and take stock of the achievement of establishing the NHS, and I'm sorry, that was a political move to establish that. You know, the Conservative Party voted against the establishment of the NHS 21 times. Politics makes things happen. And I, and it, I, I, I do, I'm not particularly attracted to the idea that we cannot trespass into having a political discussion. This is critically important for our country, and we pride ourselves on our, our NHS. And to say, the remark was that, who would want it? We do know that £10 billion worth of our NHS has already been sold. It's been carved out to a number of contractors and they, are, they preciously guard that logo, be it, be it Ramsey Healthcare, Virgin Healthcare, Richard Branson, who's ma made a fortune out of it over the years, he's pleading in poverty now, not paid a penny tax on the £200 million profit he's made in the last two years. Quite frankly, we need to be repealing the Health and Social Care Act, the Lansley Act, and bringing the, putting an end to competitive tendering, keeping that in-house. This is ruining our NHS, and it's our precious gift, and we've got to preserve it for generations to come, and we've got to fight for our NHS, and it isn't for sale. OK. Well, part of this conversation about the NHS is, of course, about how to fund it, so let's hear from Daisy Offer. The IFS say that neither main political party's spending plan is credible. When are politicians going to start being honest with the public? So this is the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who have been giving a, a bit of a commentary throughout the election, but they've made a, a, a statement today, having looked at, at both the Conservative and the Labour manifestos, uh, and have not been very impressed with either, I think it's fair to say. Sandy, as the economist on the panel here, what's your take on this? I think the IFS is absolutely right. I think that neither of the plans are credible and neither of the big major parties are being honest with voters. And I think the Tories, who are, pro are proposing a very small increase in spending, but a tiny one, which basically would be a, a kind of unambitious one-year budget, never mind a five-year budget, and they're promising not to increase taxes, not to increase income taxes, national insurance taxes, VAT, saying no tax increases. The IFS has said they're almost certainly going to spend more and they're going to have to increase taxes. And they're right. The Labour Party is being equally mendacious, though, because the Labour Party is increasing spending quite dramatically, 80 billion a year. 
It says all of that, plus all the money that we spent on capital spending and on nationalizations and so forth, and it says all of that can be funded by raising taxes only on the rich and on business. And that's just simply not true either. And so both sides, I think, are your go the Labour Party would have to raise taxes much more than it says much more broadly, and the Tory party is going to end up spending more and also have to raise taxes more. And we're just not having an honest conversation. And it seems to me that this is... There are many reasons to be depressed about this election, but sort of total lack of honesty on things that are that important strikes me as just being really deeply depressing. And so the IFS is, you know, is absolutely not... I mean, Caroline, the Green Party is planning to spend a fairly significant amount of money as well, isn't it? We are, but I would absolutely agree with Zani, first of all, that we are upfront about it. We're not embarrassed to say that, for example, on our Green New Deal, we want to spend £100 billion a year for the next 10 years because this is the greatest threat that we face. A Green New Deal would be there in order to put a massive investment in green energy, energy efficiency and so forth, in order to get us off the collision course that we're on with climate catastrophe. And I think... And how are you going to raise that money? We're going to borrow around 90 billion of it. And the reason we're going to borrow it is because when you're investing in assets, in good, positive assets that will create the jobs, then you're actually supporting the economy and you will actually find that it will pay for itself over time with the new jobs that are created and the tax that comes back into the revenue. And I think we need to have a really honest debate about how much... Of the of, of Zanny's looking very sceptical next to you, Carl. She's shaking her head, I've got to tell you. Let me just finish my point because... It is the greatest threat that we face, and if we're not going to rise to the climate crisis now, then it will be too late, and we know that. And at moments of, you know, great need, we need to rise to that challenge and put that finance there. And I don't quite know how we're going to explain to future generations, to our kids and their kids, you know, really sorry that your planet is completely trashed, but we couldn't afford to sort it out. Of course we can. We could afford to sort out the banks. We bailed out the banks when that was a problem. And no one batted an eyelid, frankly, about the amount of money that went into that. When it's the future of our planet that is at stake, we need to rise to the challenge and put that money in there. But the bottom line is, be honest about it. I agree with you. I think it was a bit odd that Labour was sort of hiding the, the changes to the marriage tax allowance. I don't know why you would do that, because you could have just said, yes, people on a marriage tax allowance are going to pay more, but actually, overall, uh, they're going to be better off, so we're going to be proud and, and say that. I think our whole discourse about tax has become incredibly embarrassed. We don't want to talk about it. Tax, fair tax, is actually something that we should be quite pleased to talk about. It should be the price that we pay to be part of a civilised society. There are things that we can buy working together that we can't buy on our own. So let's have that mature debate, let's put it on the table, and let's recognise that if we don't actually spend some significant money at this election, it will be too late as far as the climate is concerned. Sally, very briefly, you want to come back in, and then I'd like to go to the audience. Just, 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 just a, a two-second fact-check addition to that, which is that you've, what you've explained is what you're going to spend on your capital spending. You're also promising to spend something like £150 billion a year, almost twice as much as Labour, on current spending. Yes. Which, which is... Like, just, I just thought you were not being entirely honest on quite how much spending you're... The Green Party's proposals honest. are way, way, way more spending yes. than anybody else. To, I mean, substantially more, almost double more. So if you think Labour is recklessly spending, Green Party is going to spend almost twice as much. Just okay. worth but, making clear. But I, right, I, we're right. certainly not hiding that because the kinds okay. of things that it's going to go on is going to be, for example, a citizen's income, a basic income that will pay everybody as of okay. right, £89 All right, uh, uh, a week. I've given you a long time to say about what, what you're going to spend on. Uh, the woman in the pigtails, you got that. That's rather lovely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got this culture of mistrust. We are sat here listening to you knowing, reading all these documents, that what you're saying is just not true? Why is there no accountability for all of the lies that we're being told? Well, hopefully, we're trying to do a bit of that this evening with questions like that from you. Yes, the woman at the back. Hi. Um, I think, personally, going back to what that lady just said there, there is a lot of people worried about their vote in the, mo in the coming general election just for the sheer fact that we don't trust what people are being told or said and why not just give us the truth and personally I think you will probably win more votes by being honest and telling us that you need to raise taxes and the reason why you need to raise the taxes are for NHS services we're proud of our services we would happily probably contribute it's just the fact that we just don't believe anything that you say. Say this this issue of trust and not believing what politicians are saying comes up 
week after week on Question Time. I mean, I mean, Andy, what about what the IFS have said, A, about uh, Labour's spending plans, and saying that you're not go only going to be able to raise the sums that you want to raise from people earning over £80,000? They're just saying that's just not possible. And the woman there is saying, just be honest with us. Well, uh, there was also a letter in the Financial Times from 130 economists who, looking at this, approved what we were saying. And I just would... So let's, so let's be clear. So I'm not saying they're wrong, but you're saying the IFS is wrong. On this, they are wrong. They've got a view, uh, and I think we should have a, co a better conversation with them. We respect the IFS, and we do an awful lot of uh, 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 talking with, with them. But you think they're wrong on this? That, you're yeah, not, I, that you are going to get all the money you want to get from people earning over £80,000. That's it. Well, we, we've set it out. I mean, and I will also point out that we did make the suggestion, and the lady at the back was talking about the integrity of these sorts of uh, uh, proposals. And we did say that we, were, we would want our plans to be examined by the Office of Budget Responsibility so they could independently verify that. And we've often heard about people coming to elections without any details of any of the costings of the, of the plans behind their policy. So in 2017, we put, uh, published a grey book and we've, we've, we've done that again. And that's available for everybody to see. And we set out in some significant detail exactly where these uh, monies come from. And it is right that 95% of taxpayers will not see an increase in their taxes. We are looking at the people who earn uh, reasonable uh, levels of income and higher levels of income, £80,000 and above, to, to pay a little bit more. We're also asking those corporations <coughs> to pay a bit more uh, corporation tax. And Boris Johnson himself identified that taking it down to 17%, it's already come from 28% to 19%, they want to get it to 17%, is saying that would be six billion out of the pot that, that we can ill afford. And this is going back to 26%. These are not unreasonable levels. And every corporation wants to have a healthy workforce, an educated workforce. It wants to have investment in its infrastructure. So it's perfectly proper that they make a contribution, a proper contribution there to their society. And the likes of Amazon and Google, well, they can start paying some taxes because they make an awful lot of profit out of their activities in this country and pay nothing. But, but and that low, is not but sustainable. But low-earning married couples, for example, who lose 250 on your plans, they're not the Amazons and the Googles of, of this world and the not. people earning over 80 but grand. Fiona, they will well, the, the, the gains that they will get through childcare, through the minimum wage, through an increase in their salaries of 5%, through the reduction in their heating costs, that's thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. We're talking about a scale of zero to 250 pounds. It's going to be dwarfed by the savings that those very people that you're talking about are going to secure under these plans. And I think that's uh, the right way to go about because they have been punished. You know, my goodness okay. me, we have an emergency in our society. We've got homelessness and destitution and people struggling. We've got a, an outbreak of food banks growing all the time. We have to turn this around. This is a social and economic crisis going on in our country now and we simply cannot allow okay. it to go on any further. The man there with the blue sweater, the dark blue sweater, yes. Hi there. Following on from the previous theme on the NHS, Boris Johnson is not to be trusted, only in the Daily Express today. He was saying austerity was wrong, distanced himself from that. As has already been stated quite correctly, under this Tory government, there has been an increase in child poverty, an increase in food banks, it's dividing the country. And just to refer back to the IFS, there has been a 14% reduction um, in 2010, sorry, 14% less on public spending versus 2010. So the Tory government are not reversing austerity and not planning to do so. The man there in the glasses. So Labour's been talking about the Grey Book a lot and you're saying you've costed everything. However, you keep making offers to all kinds of uh, uh, people uh, in a way uh, to get votes. And say, for example, the WASP women, uh, not good... Uh, Good for them that they've been fighting for it, but 
uh, labor cannot uh, fund it properly and how would you define that? Well, it's, it's a moral obligation. These women were lost out. It's their entitlement and, and we've but got to take disputing, special measures about that. How would you fund that. it? But it's a, it's a one-off. You either take that, you either get it from reserves and if reserves aren't sufficient pounds and over five years and it, but it's an obligation, it's a moral obligation. Those women paid into the system and they were cheated. The deal was changed on them and they were looking forward to retirement. Their plans have been turned upside down. It's a moral duty of this country to put that wrong right and it cannot continue. I couldn't disagree, I couldn't disagree more. Um, government policy changes all the time. Uh, it, it creates losers and winners. Ideally, that's calculated. This was calculated. We have been retiring too early. Uh, the the uh, difference between um, men and women's retirement ages never made the slightest bit of sense. I thought it was a little condescending toward women that we can't work as long. None of us can retire that early. And furthermore, um, when government policy changes, and then, uh, and it's to, meant to save the state money, which is all of our money. Uh, the, it doesn't make any sense to then claw it back and compensate the people who lost out. I'm sorry, but this this seems to be all based on the fact that there that there were expectations of retiring at a certain point. Well, what about the expectations about of the cohort be, behind them? Wouldn't they feel cheated? Don't they need to be compensated? All of us have to make some sacrifices when... But it's the very when... women who've suffered inequality for all of their lives and they've been planning for a retirement date and that the rug is pulled out from underneath them as they approach their retirement. That has ruined lives. That has really turned people upside down. And it's an, an outrage that it ever happened. I mean, not, not all of them. It's obviously Theresa May's... She comes in that cohort. I don't think she's... Doing too badly. Well, no, and she'll be ch and she'll be taxed on it at a marginal but rate. But she's going like to get what thirty thousand pounds or something. But I'm more concerned about the woman who's on been lo on low earnings, who's been uh, so, uh, as uh, having all. But then sorts why of... not g just give the money to her, not to someone like Theresa? Because May. we believe in universality. It's a deal. You don't. You pay in. You get out. If you if you have made your contributions in full expectation that you're okay. getting that deal when you retire, the government should honour that and not betray them and renege okay. on it. Let's come back to the original question. <laughs> Which was from you, Daisy. The Institute of Fiscal Studies says both main parties' spending plans are not credible. When will politicians start being honest with the public? So, Brandy, you've been sitting here very quietly uh, while this conversation has been going on. But uh, the Conservatives have also been criticised by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, saying they're likely to spend much more than their manifesto says. Uh, well, look, we're going to spend what we've said in our manifesto. Yeah, I, look, I've been quite, I've been sitting here biting my, my lip a little bit for the last few minutes because... Have you? I thought you were just sitting about thinking, oh, phew, look, I, I, I can sit this, sit this out. <laughs> Not at all, because I think, if you look at the reality of what we're hearing, and, and Andy's quite openly gone through some of this, the reality is you've got a Labour manifesto that outlines £82 billion odd pounds worth of taxes. That doesn't account for the nationalisation costs, let alone the extra £56 billion. No, but hang on, let's talk about... Now. No, hang on, let's no, talk but, about the... No, but Andy, Andy has talked about and his. Let's talk about only, yours. Yeah, there's only made the point about our manifesto having less spending than the Greens and Labour. Yes, it does. Our manifesto outlines spending that we believe the country can afford, that allows us to invest more in the NHS, more in schools, more in infrastructure, and at the same time to make sure that we can put more money in people's pockets. That I personally do believe... I want people to have more money in their pockets, to spend in the economy, businesses to develop more jobs, 1,000 jobs a day being created since 2010 under this government. I'm very, very proud of that. But we can't sit here either believing we're talking about this in a kind of vacuum that we are, because none of this is possible unless we do the thing that Andy wants to stay away from and his leader can't make a decision about, and that's get Brexit done. Oh, We've got to get Brexit done so we can do these things and invest in our economy. Well, hang on that's a second, hang on a fact. second, hang on a second. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has also said, which is what the gentleman was referring to over there, that under the Conservatives, under the, the spending plans in your manifesto, spending on public services, apart from healthcare, would be 14% lower by the end of... Parliament, if you are to take office, than it was in 2010, 2011. That sounds like a return to austerity. Well, look, I'm, I'm not going to make any apologies for the fact that in 2010, when Labour left no money and wrote the note saying so, we had to make some very tough decisions. A, an international and, and I, financial I have to say, crisis. There was. Do not no, pretend that is right. It was the fault of the Labour right, Party. But it was the fault. So, it was. So, so Caroline, I let you finish. You know, I'm just going to finish the point. It is dishonest. 
it is, it is very real to say that the Labour government spent money the country did not have and did that before that came in. And I have to that's say, we had to make tough decisions, and we, we did do that. That now means that because of that financial uh, process of decisions we made, we can now invest in things. Poverty but the IFS, actually, and the IFS is saying sport. you're going to take... Well, actually, public services, at, you're going to go our manifesto, what, our manifesto outlines a couple of things. First of all, as was rightly said, we are not going to increase VAT, income tax or national insurance. In fact, we want to raise the threshold for national insurance so people keep more money in their pockets whilst we do increase investment in these things and have a surplus for our country so we can so fix the roof while the sun the is money shining. Into the schools, but again, into the hospitals, to do all, into all of this, these things that you're well, because, promising, because we've you had, can't just make Because we've had up. and we will continue to have good financial management of the economy, we can make those investments. As okay. we have outlined, so including, ask... yes, 40 new hospitals. But, so, I, uh, but none of this is possible. Six. None of this, no, it's not. It's six ways in the ground now, and we've got the seed funding, so we will deliver 40 new hospitals. You There's might, no point you scare you might There's deliver no 40 point new scare hospitals. hospitals. Join in Andy on this. I know Andy likes these Labour like chaotic coalitions, but this is the reality is, and to do any of this, we have to have certainty for our economy to develop, and to do that, we have to de finish okay. this Brexit situation. Okay. We've got this to get it Brexit done. This Brexit will make the country a hell of a lot poorer, so it just doesn't add up. And I think that you've just right, there's lots of hands up, and I'd like to hear from the woman here in the front in the green. Hi, uh, my son is recently um, turned 18. Um, how do you suggest I encourage him to vote for you when, as all he hears, are lies and broken promises? He's not, you know, he's not thinking of voting, which I, you know, I think is travesty. OK. And there's a, a woman here in the grey sweater at the front as well. OK. Now, obviously, you're all banking on us coming out to vote for you all. But what is the point of us even coming out of our front doors when it seems like we might as well be going to Disneyland because no-one seems to make any truth? You promise us money that you haven't got, as you did with Brexit two years ago. And in the meantime, saying about building 40 hospitals... By the time it comes to that stage, we won't even have an NHS. It'll be gone. Right. I mean, just before I go to the rest of you, I mean, what do you think when you hear people in the front? I mean, I hear this week after week on question. People don't mm. believe what they're hearing. They are disenfranchised. They're not sure if they want to turn out and vote. You're thinking about your I mean, are you proud of yourselves? Do you think you're doing a great job? No, I, I've got to say, I think... Anybody, 18 or any age, I would encourage them to vote. However they vote, I would encourage them to use their vote. I have to, I've been embarrassed to be part of our parliament over the last year or so. I think whatever you think of Brexit, I, my personal view is we had a democratic decision. The job of the parliament and our government is to deliver it. And we have legit just failed consistently, particularly in the last year or two, to get that done. And I can understand that. Plus, the, you know, Andy was saying things earlier on that I fundamentally disagree with and misleading on the NHS. With all of that and Parliament, and Parliament not today, delivering on the main thing it's been tasked please, to do since 2016, this? and of course in the 2017 general election, I understand why there is frustration. Okay. I see it on the doorstep. That's why we're being yourself. very clear you're, you're that you can't do again. any of this Caroline, unless we get Caroline. that done. And we deliver on He's Brexit. He's just doing it again in the sense of saying that Parliament was this terrible mess and, and he had to have this election because it was such chaos in Parliament. Parliament had, much to my regret, but Parliament had given that deal of Boris Johnson a 30-vote majority. It had gone through its first reading and its second reading oh, in Parliament. You could no. have no, carried no, no, on. The reason that you didn't was because Boris Johnson decided that there was narrow political advantage for him going for a general election right now. It had nothing to do with not being able to get Brexit done, and that is such a lie in itself because... Getting Brexit done is going to go on for years and years because we're only finishing the first part. There's going to be years of negotiations with the EU about what the next kind of uh, trade deal is going to look like. But there was no need for this general election. Parliament had voted by 30 votes to go ahead with the second reading of the withdrawal bill, which was the next stage in Boris Johnson's bill. So I just feel so frustrated because I agree with you. You know, it is an awful thing when politics is held in such disrespect, disrepute, and I really, really understand how you feel. But I just think we have to be honest all the way through. And when Brandon is still saying, making up reasons for even why we're having this general election and getting Brexit done, these sound bites that he'll wheel out at every moment, just I just think that degrades politics for all of us, and we should be better than that. Right. Andy, you want to come in? No, let, let me... Let, no, hang on a minute. Hang on. Let me... Andy, very briefly, because this is the accusation, and as I say, I hear week after week, that, that politics is degraded, that people are lying, that no-one believes a word politicians say. Yeah, well, I, I, I recognise that and empathise, because... And are you, I, are you, are you as I, bad as the rest? Well, let me, let me answer, answer that, because she makes a, a good point. I, you know, quite, quite frankly, I, I do try 
uh, to lay information and, and evidence in front of people. And I am appalled by the, the discourse in the conversation in the country more broadly. Um, and I think politicians have a, a lot to answer for in that respect. And, and, and we, we live in a, a media uh, bubble where a lot of attention is paid to that. And quite frankly, I get a little bit disappointed about this whole business of it, it being entertaining and people shutting discussion down and, and, and not getting to the end of a discussion. And Chris Patton, uh, a, a Tory uh, MP and, and sits in the Lords, he said something a few years ago I thought it was very, very uh, uh, accurate. He said the trouble with the modern discourse is that nobody is prepared to read to the end of the paragraph. So we don't get uh, a thorough discussion about these critical issues. And I do wish things were evidence-based. And that is exactly why I was saying that this sort of document should be subjected to scrutiny by the Office for Budget Responsibility. So you've got some independent assessment. I would welcome that. I think that's the better way to do it so people can make informed choices. And lastly, I think there's a boy who doesn't, who's, who's not going to be voting at 18, I just plead with him. You know, people won this vote. But it was very hard won. And it's, it's our precious gift. And I know politics drives people mad. And we've gone through election after election. But please... Yeah. Don't ever, I'm speaking to him really, please don't <laughs> give up this precious gift. It's too, too important. Okay. <laughs> right. We're going to move on in a moment, but before we do, I just want to tell you that next week we are in Hull, and the following week we will be live in Wandsworth in London. That's the day after the election. Let's see if your son votes. Uh, that's at 8.30pm on Friday the 13th. Let's see if that date lives up to its reputation. Uh, there'll also be another Question Time election special, this time for the under 30s. It kind of rules us out, guys, I hate to say it. Uh, which is live on BBC One on Monday, the 9th of December. It's from York with all seven UK parties. It's chaired by my colleague Emma Barnett. And as the title suggests, you do have to be aged between 18 and 30 to get into the audience for that one. But if you'd like to be in that audience, or for any of those programmes, call 0330-123-9988 or go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. Right, let's take another question now. I'm going to take two in a row, actually. Um, so can I hear first of all from Derek Thomas and then straight after from Matthew Hinton? OK. Um, right, regarding racism in the Conservative Party, uh, does Boris's one bounce and you're out not apply to him? And Matthew Hinton, where are you? Uh, here. Uh, what are we to make of Jeremy Corbyn's repeated refusal on the Andrew Neil show to apologise for the anti-Semitism he has presided over? Right. Well, I'm not going to start with you. Lana, I'm going to start with you on that. Uh, yeah, I watched that interview. Um... Uh, Corbyn didn't look good. I don't quite understand why he didn't uh, apologize in that uh, he's apologized before. Um, and I recognize that there are two different kinds of apology. There's the kind where you say you're sorry, you're regretful, and you're sorry it's your fault. And I think he's very reluctant to make the latter kind of apology. Uh, and what about the first question regarding racism in the Conservative Party? I don't... I'm. I have found the evidence of uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party uh, more persuasive. That, uh, that is, it's more of an institutional problem than I find um, the sporadic evidence in the Tory party. If nothing else, uh, you know, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is Muslim, and uh, that's the second most powerful position. Well... Muslim background. I mean, Saeed Avasi has said... Uh, has a powerful position in the country. I mean, Saeed Avasi in the Conservative Party said, dossier after dossier, dozens and dozens of cases being presented with the most vile evidence of racism within the party, the Conservative Party, at every level, from members of parliament all the way down to ordinary activists. So she certainly feels there's, there's quite a bit of it. Caroline? Well, I think that racism in all its forms is obviously vile and unacceptable and we need to do everything we possibly can to, to stamp it out. I think the idea that because there's a, a minister from a particular faith, a minister in this case who is Muslim, somehow that lets off the rest of the party from being able to have to live up to better standards. And we know that there has been an up rise in, 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 in racism around the times when Boris Johnson does refer to Muslim women wearing burqas as, as letterboxes and so forth. That, that is, that is evidence-based. So 
I, I, it goes back, in a sense, to the Why question we were so just insulting? having. Why is that it's just because an it's, image. He was being lighthearted. It, I it, it gets it taken out like, of context. We'll tell you what, hang on. Let's ask the woman in the audience. You want to talk about that? What about the rhetoric you use about people in letterboxes when I walk down the street and I get told exactly. after that to go back to my own country? Exactly. I am yes. from here. I am from, from here. When I get from that rhetoric, I get told to go back to my own country. That was an image... Take responsibility. That was an image yeah. taken... And you are spreading hate by saying that. What is wrong with saying it's a letterbox? Yeah. You're spreading hate and racism. The consequences from that. Is, this is not a standard slur. It's and not a it, joke. It, it you shouldn't mock someone's image. religion. You should not mock someone's the, religion. Did you read the original op-ed? Did you read the, the, the piece? Called. He was standing up for... Muslim women's right to wear whatever they want. That also, yeah. Why is that cab. racist? That also new, includes the niqab. And th take con a con uh, this consequence to what you say. He, was, he because wanted of that, you to be able I get to wear the, in the street and I'm talking on behalf of many Muslims. I get told to go back to my... I get physically assaulted just walking to the gym in broad daylight. There's consequences to saying something like that. Brian, it's because it's coming from you. But I don't see how you can get to them. I, I am very sorry to hear, hear about your experience, but I, I can't see how one you can, many, how you can, how you can okay. blame Boris Johnson. Well, Brandon, oh, this oh, is oh, clearly oh, the man who would be Prime Minister. I mean, this is not the first time this has come up on the programme, I have to say. Well, look, I, and he I, said, one, I, one, one bounce and you're out, does that not apply to himself? That was the question. Well, and, and one bounce and you're out is how our party has acted. I have to say, when, whenever the party has found somebody in our party who has acted in a way that is abusive or wrong about any religion or any race. Oh, no, somebody who's experienced bullying, somebody who's, you know, my descendants come from the Jew are Jewish. So anything like that is completely unacceptable. And you should not ever have to suffer from anybody the kind of abuse you are talking about. But and there's I consequences do agree, I have to, say, to your actions of what you say. Yeah. Do you not understand that? I, I, I do no understand. I have to well. say, I do believe that there are repercussions for what we say, and we as politicians have to think about the language we use. But I would also defend the Prime Minister's right and any oh, politician's yeah, yeah, sorry, right for his, yeah. to actually use to, to use language to make a point. And that particular... Well, so, so, well, and you're defending honest. the right for him no, to say that, we're, let me that just, women look like letterbox. Like I say, the point I was going to make, if I can finish it, is the article he wrote, which, he, which I don't think from the way you actually, you've read it, is worth reading. It oh. was an article arguing for... Um, people having the right to wear what they want, to not to be forced into wearing but something or not wearing really something, which actually is a voice. very, very important point. And I think it is right for us as a liberal society, people should have the right to wear what they want. But in the Conservative but Party, and this is one of the things want. I have to say I'm very, very proud of in the Conservative Party, if, and people talked about dossiers, but I've got to say, my experience with it was there's often a big difference between the reality and what people say, because somebody online saying something doesn't mean they're a member of our party, but actually, we have dealt with cases. If we find somebody who's acted in a way that's inappropriate, whatever type of inappropriate behaviour that is, that has been dealt with, it's been dealt with swiftly, not these tons and tons of cases sitting around for sometimes like Kenneth Stone years, not being dealt with by the Labour Party. That is quite a different situation, and I think it's abhorrent to see what we saw on Andrew Neil the other night. OK, well, let's, that was the other question. So, why did Jeremy Corbyn... He has apologised before in a meaningful way. Why was he not able to do that on Andrew I'm Neil? I'm glad you acknowledge that because he has acknowledged uh, and apologised on several occasions for the hurt caused to uh, members of the Jewish community. So, so why, why... It was kind of an awkward moment, wasn't it? Why did he just not, not say, I'm sorry? He has said... He is sorry. He is sorry that this has happened. He's no, not, he's not, what, he's the not, question was, why didn't he say he's it not, when, he's when he's asked? He's not used on weasel night. words about it. You know, when you hear people say, I'm sorry for any offence that may have been caused. No, no, no. no, no and has, I've made that clear. So why didn't well, he say. I'm, the question is, why well, was he unable to say sorry we, on Monday we, night? We can't get through. Because he, what he's trying to do is, having made those apologies, publish them. And he repeated them the following day, by the way, um, is to get on to the proactive measures that we want to take as an incoming government to give those protections to the Jewish community. But you, you can still say sorry and then talk about that as well. We've seen sorry and, and we, we, we've made that apology, but I think it's very, very important to set out exactly the steps that we'll be taking in terms of the protections afforded to places of worship, of education, and to address the whole issues, a whole gamut of, 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 of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, other forms of racism in our national curriculum to, to ensure that we start building that capacity. But quite frankly, 
for this denial over this terrible choice of words about letterboxes. I don't really, I'm not bothered about the article. It's the choice of the words that have been used. And as a direct result of those offensive comments, you know, hate crimes increased. People were assaulted be because of the words chosen by the Prime Minister. And we now see this slew of articles in The Spectator that have been unearthed about his rampant misogyny and his abuse of women. It's an absolute outrage, okay. and I don't see the same attention paid. Is that it? There was a poll out this week that said a third of voters consider both Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson to be racist. A third. That is the... It's just appalling. The two people who are most... One of whom is most likely to be the next Prime Minister, a third of voters think they were racist. So I think we have a real problem, and I think there's a real problem on both sides. I think in the Labour Party, it is an institutionalised problem that has come in the last few years with the arrival of Momentum and Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, and, I'm no, let me just finish, let me just finish. That's not quite true. Let me just finish. Let me there, just there finish. Well, let, let, let's MPs point, have been it. hounded out of the party. And, yes, there's talk of looking into things, but there is... I think when you have the chief rabbi speaking out as he did this week, it suggests there is a very serious problem. Now, there is also a problem in the Tory party. And the choice of words by Boris Johnson on this subject and, indeed, on others is, you know, appalling. And there's no way of going around it. It's a stain on the Tory party. And during the leadership campaign, Boris Johnson said there would be an independent inquiry into Islamophobia in the party. And to my knowledge, that has not happened. So I think in both cases, in both cases, the parties are falling really radically short of where they should be. Okay. Just, let, no, just, just a minute. Let, let, well, there's going to be an inquiry, but it's not independent. Yeah. And it's into... It it's, independent. It's, OK, it but it's into, into all forms of prejudice, not just yeah. into Islamophobia, as was promised on, on television, live television, I think. Yes, the woman there. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn made an apology back in 2008, and it just seems to me that it doesn't matter how many times he apologises, it's never enough. What happens to forgiveness? Why does somebody have to keep on saying the same thing over and over again and not being believed? There are two black women that sit regularly on the front benches with Jeremy Corbyn. If there was rampant racism in the Labour Party, I'm sure they would have known about it and identified it. I don't believe that he gets a fair deal from the media or the press in terms of that. We know that these media moguls sit there wanting to protect their position and their millions that they, that they park off overseas um, in, in offshore accounts and they see him as a threat to that position. And this, that's what this is all about. And quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of it. I see it go on on a regular basis, the, the, the continual pummeling of Jeremy Corbyn for no good reason. And it just seems to me that people just don't understand or, or recognise a decent person when they see one anymore. <laughs> they want people to keep on being nasty and spiteful and evil okay. all the time. And it's not right. Well, I can see you people... get back to decent values. I can see people agreeing with you. Certainly the sentiment, people agreeing with on some of it and shaking their head uh, at some of it as well. I'm afraid we have to end it there. I think we could... I feel like we've, we've, we've got so much more we could say, but I'm afraid... I still don't know what Andy thinks on Brexit yet. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> Brandon. Oh, Brandon. Yeah. Come on. Uh, our hour is up. Phew, you might say. Our hour is up. Next Thursday, we'll be in Hull. And the week after that, we will be back the day after the election. Where will we be then, folks? Who knows what will have happened? That's Friday the 13th, live on BBC One at 8.30pm. You don't want to miss that. And that programme will come from Wandsworth in London. So in addition to those programmes, there'll be a Question Time election special. Remember I told you about that earlier, for the under-30s, a week on Monday. That's the 9th of December in York, chaired by uh, Emma Barnett. So do please apply if you're under 30 and you have things to say. And judging from this audience, I think there'll be plenty of you. Call 0330 if you'd like to be in the audience or go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. But for now, thank you very much to my panel, to all of you for coming and putting your points across so brilliantly and, of course, to you at home for watching and listening from Swindon. Bye-bye. <laughs>